Today we continue in our study in the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 17 in the book of Revelation, this last book in the Bible written by the Apostle John, written about the revealing and unveiling of the person and ministry of Jesus Christ at the end of the age, wrapping up the history of man in this world. It is a book that is fascinating to men, and I trust that it things that we are interested in too. Although church saints will not have to go through uh, most of the events of this book, it tells about our inheritance and our future ministries in life and eternity. And so it is a great profit to the life. Today we see God destroy the system of false religion in the world, in the trio. It's not that men will, <clears throat> every one of them will turn to him. We're not saying that, but we are saying that Satan has an organized uh, system of false religion and body of truth passed down and traceable in history and that that uh, system that has promoted evil in the past will be destroyed if we look at it today. We want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer that we want to read these 18 verses of chapter 17. Great is the mystery of godliness and great is the mystery of iniquity. Help us, Father, to read and study and know your word and get the perspective of, of truth. Lord, help us to always believe and know what you have said and understand it and live it and put it into practice in our lives. <clears throat> we know that that in the world that is false is of no profit to us and it is no uh, does not originate from thee and can do no work for thee it is against thee and Lord there is so much confusion so much wrong teaching so much uh, worldly thinking so much evil in the philosophies of our day and they have crept even into many of our churches and we pray Lord that we may be pure and right and true and holy before you. May we not uh, look to our own understanding. May we not uh, <coughs> uh, manufacture uh, truth. And may we not be uh, unloving and unkind towards others around us, even those that are wrong. May we, if we have an opportunity, uh, tell them the truth. But where your word and its emphasis are important, may we never compromise it for the sake of, of uh, allegiance and peace. May we never uh, live and teach and promote and be linked to that which is false. And Lord, may we see the end of the destruction of Babylon today in its mystery. And may we understand how you feel and what your attitude is toward false teachers and that which is against your word we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls and talked with me, saying, uh, Come unto me, come here, and I will show thee the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered piece, full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and bedecked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of 
abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name read, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. And the angel said unto me, Why did thou wonder? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her which had seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life and the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and are seven kings. The word there is not in the Greek text, and this should be rendered, and are seven kings, that is, the seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, it is the eighth, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And these have one bind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with Him are called chosen and faithful. And He saith unto me, The water which thou sawest, where the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdoms unto the beast until the words of God be fulfilled. And the woman that thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. We often talk about God's plan for us, how that God has purposed to save and redeem through His cross and that the death of the Lord Jesus for our sins is the center of God's program and then the eternity which He is planning for all His saints to follow. Well, Satan has a plan for the earth too. And Sometimes we don't see it as clearly as God's plan, but today we get to look at a little bit of, of Satan's plan and, and the mystery of iniquity and things that he has purposed and the things that he has done upon this earth. Now one of Satan's strategy is to confuse the truth with a thousand false religions and so we have Buddhism and we have Hinduism and we have Shinduism and the East and and we have all kind of, of uh, beliefs and ideas and false teachings and misrepresentations and, and cults and, and all kind of things existed in our world today. But Satan <clears throat> has always used a traceable influence in the world to to. Uh, promote some of his evil pagan teachings. Now all the religions of today are not paganism, but the, the, uh, the uh, belief of unsaved men, the, the worship of demons and spirits, the, uh, the false religions of the past. We see them in the Word of God beginning uh, in this city of Babylon was the Bible character called Nimrod, which was a great and wicked person in his day. He had an evil wife named Ceramicus, and they had a son named Tammuz. And 
the, the Persian, the uh, mystic, the uh, occult, uh, things that we have today are directly traceable to them. And this great city and this great system of belief, and remember the Tower of Babel, God decided that he needed to stop their growth because they said we're going to build a tower right up into the very presence of God and we're great and, and mighty and we're going to control and rule the wall. And they almost had friend, but God confused their language and they, wasn't, they weren't able to finish the tower and they had to isolate themselves according to language and according to uh, uh, their uh, physical characteristics and their family uh, traits. And, and this developed later into what we call races as they were divided and, and uh, intermarried and within themselves and so those distinctions became more prominent. But God did that in Babylon. And Babylon was the beginning of Satan's development of his religion and his falseness. Now, we see that in Babylon. We see that in Egypt. When Babylon and the Babylonian Empire was destroyed and their worldwide influence drained, and Egypt became a prominent country in the world and in that region and dominated. And so we find these same mystery religions in Egypt. And then later, when in the Roman Empire, when Christianity grew so, and God's plan and God's work was progressing, remember how that Constantine, uh, when he won the victory and united the Roman Empire, how he brought in the pagan priest, and, and they weren't converted, friend. They didn't get saved. They didn't uh, suddenly see the truth of the Word of God and believe in it. But he brought all these pagan uh, a priest and all these pagan worshipers that had carried down the idea from Babylon and he made them the religious leaders along with the Christians in the church. And so the world and the church got all mixed up together and from that came the Roman Catholic system that dominated the dark ages with all its paganism and with all its, its unbiblical practices and thinking the mother of God idea came from this very source. Uh, uh, a lot of other, the crossing of, of one's being. In fact, there was uh, the, uh, this it can be found in cultures long before Roman Catholic uh, faith existed and religion existed. This was the idea is that the Tamaz, the son of Ceramuses and Nimrod, it was taught and believed in a copycat way of what God was going to do, that Tamaz was going to be resurrected from the dead and supposedly received a great wound and was resurrected. And the remembering of Tamaz is the sign of the cross. And this is why the Roman Catholics, we believe, crossed themselves. Because it was a pagan custom that was all over the world, even before even before uh, A.D. civilization and time and, and A.D. began. And we see Satan's attempt as he moved this wicked, occult, uh, demon-type religion from Babylon to Egypt to mixing it with Christianity and the Roman Catholic system and predominating the world. And then this woman is seen as as when the church is raptured and the saved people are caught up together with the Lord and before the beginning of the tribulational period, the religious system that's in the world that claims to be Christianity, and, and they will unite the Protestants with the Roman Catholics, and there will be one world church that says we're the church, but there will be a false church, and they will go into the tribulational period and the Antichrist will use their influence and they will link up with him. And that's why they're seen together in this chapter. But it won't just be the Roman Catholic system. It will be the passing on of all these mystery and all the false teachings that, that Satan has particularly used to dominate the world and confuse the, the, the saint. It will be the passing on of those things. And we see that here. And that's what 
we're dealing with fear. Now remember that Satan always imitates what God does. Just as we've seen in chapter 13, just as God is a trinity, Satan wants to have a trinity of his work. He empowers the Antichrist who empowers the false prophet. And we, we see the, the unholy trinity. Satan wanted to be God, and so he, he tried to do things and act like God did. But, of course, his character is evil, and so he can never be a true righteousness, but only imitate certain things about the working of God. And this system, this horror that goes into the tribulational period is an embodiment, is the final end of, of this system that has been passed on uh, from Babylon to Egypt to the Roman Catholic system uh, and, and into our day. And from it has spring many false ideas. But this is not just <clears throat> false ideas uh, in particular. It is, it is the occult, the, this pagan worship that we've always had in the world. And the ideas of uh, sacrifice. And you know today that people that worship the devil sacrifice chickens and animals and blood sacrifices. It is, these dark, demoniacal practices uh, uh, and, and the uh, false religions are embodied in this. And so we see the one world church in the tribulation period. We say today we see God destroy Babylon and the system of false religion and how do we see that? Well, first of all, in 1 through 6, we see that by looking at the harm. We're going to look at this woman and see who she is. And we've already said who she was. She is the, the embodiment of false religion, the primary confusion that Satan is going to use, the great imitation uh, of God's work. Saying this is the truth to the world. We're the church. And this woman is going to be made up, as we said, of of, of unsaved people that were in any Protestant churches that weren't saved and therefore they weren't raptured. They may have said they were, it looked like they were, but many people are. They claim to be. We don't know who is and who isn't. But those that will be left will be unsaved and they will wake up. And there's been a lot of talk about that being happening, of, of everybody getting together and after all, uh, everybody is brothers and and Catholics and Protestants getting together on common ground. And we see this happening in minor areas for years. And there have been talk about it and ideas about well, what will happen in this tribulational period. And we'll have one world official church. And we see this in this person, the woman, the harlot. Now notice her character. Though she wears scarlet and purple, and, and many people have isolated uh, this mystery religion to Rome, and because of the great persecution of the Roman Catholics and the great martyrdom of the Reformation, and because of the, the, the colors, and because of the seven hills upon which the woman sits, and, and many people have felt that a pope would be the Antichrist, somebody in the past, and we're going to look at that verse. Verse 8, it, it kind of hints at that. It may be talking more about the system that arises than the, the person of the Antichrist, but he may be a character from the past, but we don't see the absolute necessity of that. But this, this harlot, this woman, uh, her colors are scarlet and purple. She's bedecked with great and, and material blessings and gold and precious stones. But her cup is full of filth in its friend, and it's full of fornication, and it's full of sexual impurity, and it's full of teachings that are, are fornications and, and adulteries against the truth of God. And she has had great influence upon the earth, and she's been involved in killing the true saints of God, as we see. A terrible Jezebel type. Jezebel is an example and a picture of what this woman is. The system is a lie. This 
and she sits on the beast. She uses the influence and the power of the beast. The beast carries her, but the beast also uses her, too. And they have this relationship together. So we say this is the world system. This is the fall of the church. Fear of the heart. And then we understand how God's going to destroy this false church and this false system by seeing the relationship of the harlot and the beast in 7 through 13. Now this is very important, not only for the, to understand their relationship, but to see who the beast is and what his kingdom is like. Uh, now there was a, an explanation of that in, in chapter 7 by the angel and uh, why did you wonder the angel says I'm going to explain to you about the relationship of the beast and the harlot now the beast in verse 8 is a revival of the Roman Empire that's how he comes to, to power and many times what is said about the kingdom and the political system can be said about the person that heads that system and vice versa and it may be true here and we don't know for sure which the Bible was talking about, and it's possible it's talking about both. And that's why some have felt that this will be some evil character from the past. There is uh, some indication Judas' character may be the Antichrist. They're thinking that Hitler might be, that Nimrod might be, that some evil person from the past will be uh, let loose and brought back. And we don't know how that that could be arranged, seeing that God is the supreme power. But Satan can do many things, and God allows him to do anything that he does. But that, I don't believe, is a necessity that that be. It may be that that's the way it's going to be. But this beast is going to send out of the bottomless pit. That's He's going to come the system, and maybe the person too. And in verse 9, this is where I want to spend some time, Brent, because it, Rome has always been known to be the, 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 uh, the city of seven hills. And here in verse 9, the, the writer says, listen, I want you to use wisdom because here's something that you're going to have to, here's a mystery and here's something that's not obviously understood. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman set it. Well, a lot of Bible scholars, especially during and after the domination of Rome in the world, said, well, that's Rome. They're, they're the city that sits on seven hills. And really, these seven hills of Rome really aren't seven mountains. They're just little seven little hills. And, and at times, as the, Rome, as the city expanded, it grew to eight and to nine hills. But on the basis of chapter, uh, verse 10, and the, 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 the scripture, the text should read, and even if it, the word there uh, was, the explanation is, and, and the word there is not in the Greek text, and it should read, and are seven kings. But uh, the seven kings are the seven hills, or the seven mountains upon which the woman sit. Now, I believe in the literal interpretation of scripture, but where scripture gives explanation that things are figurative, we ought to realize that they're figurative. And many times in Scripture, this word mountain is used of the word kingdom. It is, it is a, a word, a symbol, a picture of a kingdom. And so when sometimes the Bible is talking about kingdom, it speaks of it as a great mountain. And sometimes it talks about a literal mountain, and the context must determine which is so. And I think based on the context here, we understand that these seven mountains are seven kings. And five of them have already ceased to be. And, and John wrote in the day when Rome was the uh, kingdom in authority. And the revived Roman Empire is the seventh of which the, the beast comes. And he's the eighth. And his power base is made up of ten kingdoms that are not yet in John's day, but will be in the future day. I'm not even sure that, that they're allied together in power structures today. They may be, it may be something like the common market. It may be countries different from the common market. But we see the relationship between the harlot and the beast. And then we see the destruction of the harlot. 
these ten nations will uh, see the problems with the beast and they will uh, with the harlot and they will hate God will put it in their makeup to get rid of this religious system and to destroy it and it will be burnt with fire it will be destroyed the, the ten kings will reject it and will destroy this system in their last day and they will give their power to the beast and so we see the destruction of this religious system and this harlot in these verses. In verse 15, the waters are uh, the influence of the harlot, though it be in these ten kingdoms, and they will lead the, the uh, destruction of this. The influence of the harlot is over the whole world, of course. And God will put it in their hearts to destroy it and the woman. And so we see here the destruction of the system and of Babylon. And uh, it mentions a city which is representative of, in the last verse, is a representative of its influence and power. And the city of Babylon is in, in chapter 18, and we're going to look at that next time. But see the woman, the false religion, the system that Satan, passed down through the ages and influenced the world at different times with the evil imitations of the truth of God. And her destruction is sure. And so we say prophet today from the Word of God. Don't be involved in that which is false. Be involved in understanding and believing and teaching this Word I pray.